Welcome, everybody. This is Robin Elliott. I'm the Executive Director at the Parkinson's Disease Foundation. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the fifth talk in PDF's fourth series of expert briefings. Uh, this one is uh, an ever-popular one and central to all our interests, whatever they may be. This is one we all share, namely medical therapies, what's in the Parkinson's pipeline. Um, I should remind you, those of you who are on the um, uh, looking, uh, communicating through the computers, that you can download the PowerPoint slides from our website and the reminder email you received this, mo uh, you received this morning for this talk, if you wish. That's just a, just a tip you might want to take advantage of. Um, in this series, we cover some of the most important topics in Parkinson's today. We actually pick them uh, from uh, crowdsourcing. That's a, a phrase of the moment, which I learned about a year ago. And we crowdsource here by asking you, um, our communicants in these, in these seminars, these mass seminars, to tell us the topics you're interested in. And this is one that always comes up, and we're very happy to say that this is a, a series that really does reflect uh, the views and interests of the people who participate. Um, I should say that I'm very grateful uh, to the uh, sponsors for this series, uh, two companies. One is AbbVie Inc. Incorporated, used to be called Abbott Pharmaceuticals, changed its name, AbbVie, and uh, Teva Neuroscience, and a third company, UCB. So we're very grateful to AbbVie, to Teva, and to UCB for sponsoring this series. I should remind you, those of you who don't know us at the PDF, that this is only one of the things that we do. If you're interested in finding out other things that we do that you might be interested in and to take advantage of, please do visit our website, which is the shortest domain name in the business, www.pdf.org, and you can learn more about uh, both the expert briefings and also uh, other educational programs we have um, if you're interested in that too. My great pleasure to uh, to introduce our speaker for the day, Dr. Kapil Sethi. Um, uh, he's a long-time um, expert neurologist with um, uh, a long pedigree of accomplishments in uh, clinical care and also in clinical research, where his um, primary interests are in clinical trials uh, and the development of new therapies, and in particular, um, the non-motor aspects of Parkinson's disease, which um, command his attention recently particularly and uh, is a big interest of his now in his research. Um, he's Professor of Neurology and Director of the Movement Disorder Program at Georgia Health Sciences University, which is in Augusta. Um, I'm not sure whether he attended the Masters last week uh, in the rain, but uh, I didn't ask him that yet. Maybe I'll tell us afterwards. But um, certainly those of us who like golf were watching that. And now we're moving from golf to Parkinson's, going up in the scale, and, and up in the scale, too, of of expertise and enjoyment, because I think this is going to be a, just a terrific session. Um, he has been in his position at, um, at uh, Georgia Health Sciences University. He's been director also of the National Parkinson Foundation Center of Excellence. That's a comrade organization of ours based in Florida, the NPF, and uh, we're very happy to welcome him in all these, in all these capacities. He also, as, as a full disclosure, he told me, uh, wants you to know that he's employed as a senior medical expert of neurology at Mertz Pharmaceuticals, um, where he uh, works with industry. Um, he was born in India, educated there, and then went from there to the UK, where he worked and uh, was trained in, in, in London and also in Wales, and then came to this country, I don't know how many years ago, but quite a number at this point, uh, to uh, become what looks as, uh, from the back end of his resume, like uh, he's a public citizen of the field. There's no major organization in Parkinson's medicine that Dr. Sethi has not been involved with in one form or another. And I'm not going to go through all of them. It'll take half our time. Uh, suffice it to say that he's a major public citizen in the science and the education and the medicine of the field. And um, um, as always with the people we have presenting in this series, he joins a very long and distinguished list of people who have honored us by their presence at these uh, briefings. So, Dr. Sethi, the floor is yours. You'll be speaking for 25, 30 minutes, I believe, to your slides, which people have access to. And then we will be opening the floor to questions which we will have received by then from people who um, uh, can email them to us. And while you're talking, we'll be sifting them and organizing them and be ready to ask the questions once you are through. Dr. Sethi, thank you so much. And um, we're, we'll be very interested and fascinated by your talk. Thank you, uh, Robin. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. And yes, I was at Augusta National uh, on Saturday, which was probably the most beautiful day, but the finish was just amazing. Um, unfortunately, uh, the events um, of yesterday, of course, put a damper on some of uh, 
the excitement and, and stuff we were feeling and our thoughts and prayers are with those that are hurt in the blasts in Boston and I'm sure there are uh, people participating in this call that are from that part of the world. So moving on to uh, what is in the pipeline, uh, that's the uh, topic. Now you may want to, I don't think you will have any question that we do need uh, new medications, but following are some of the reasons why we we need new drugs for Parkinson's disease. We don't have a drug that has been conclusively shown to slow down the rate of clinical decline in Parkinson's disease. There are many studies that have been done, uh, some suggestive, like uh, ones with MAOB inhibitors and others entirely negative. We also know that the existing drugs that benefit motor problems have limitations. Levodopa is the most potent drug. It results in motor response fluctuations and dyskinesias. And dopamine agonists uh, are not as potent and also have the additional baggage of causing neuropsychiatric side effects, including but not limited to impulse control disorders. In addition, the burden of non-motor symptoms, such as autonomic disturbances, bowel, bladder, blood pressure changes, then subsequently cognitive issues, and psychiatric issues, including depression and anxiety, are poorly addressed by and large by currently available therapy. And these problems can be early, but they definitely progress as the disease progresses. So if we can find a way to slow down the disease, not only will we help motor problems, but also help the non-motor problems. The gait and balance problems are also inadequately addressed by the currently available therapies. We haven't been quiet. I know that it seems like we haven't had many new drugs in this field, but the next slide here shows you all the drugs we've tried. This is incomplete. There were about 10 others. A lot of these, try, a lot of these drugs have been tried in various uh, situations. Unfortunately, they have failed, and with the exception of estradafalin, which I'll discuss a little later, others will probably not come back. Now, there are currently over 100 new therapies under development for Parkinson's disease, and these drugs have several aims. One is, of course, the holy grail, the disease modification or slowing the clinical decline, uh, slash neuroprotection, which is a more precise term, but perhaps a little sexier. And then other drugs are being developed to improve the symptomatic management, uh, motor symptoms, and then subsequently non-motor. And those will be the areas under which, the, the headings under which I'll discuss the new drugs in development. So some definitions, we don't have to spend too much time, but neuroprotection actually is defined as, as an as a intervention that rescues, protects the vulnerable neurons, and, that's, and then it slows, stops, or reverses disease progression. Whereas if you just, stick to the generic slowing the clinical progression, then whatever the mechanism, uh, that effect can be clinically measured and we cannot see the underlying vulnerable neurons, but at least we can imply that we're doing something that's either promoting compensation or may actually be protecting neurons. So slowing the clinical progression seems to be a term that most of us are using these days. Now, why have we had such a hard time developing neuroprotective or disease-modifying therapies in Parkinson's disease? Well, I think we don't understand clearly what are the biological processes that lead to cell death. We have ideas, including a very uh, recent uh, popular hypothesis called prion hypothesis, where there's an abnormal protein that's not infectious if, if in the ordinary sense of the word, but it could transmit itself from one cell to the other. And of course, that has still got to be confirmed. We have several animal models, but they don't accurately reflect the onset and progression of Parkinson's disease. So a lot of drugs that seem to work in animal models, especially the one that's the most commonly used, which is MPTP model, they fail in clinical trials because one, MPTP Parkinsonism is not clinical PD, and it's very restrictive lesion. 
the lesion doesn't progress. It's a massive lesion, whereas Parkinson's starts slowly and progresses slowly. And we've had trouble developing a faithful animal model. And then if a drug works in the animal model, we don't know what dose to bring to the clinic. We could be giving too much. Some drugs have so-called inverted use, so they're better in lower dose and maybe not so good in higher dose. So we really don't have a way to translate this animal research into clinic. Also, as you know, everybody has their own Parkinson's disease. It's not one disease, so heterogeneity introduces another problem. There are young Parkinson's patients, there are old ones, there are those that are tremor dominant, those that are gait and balance problem dominant, and those that progress slower, others progress a little quicker. Some get cognitive issues early, others get it later, but we lump all of them in these large trials, which will give us statistically valid results, but they may not be applicable to a given patient. So we will miss effects in, in small populations, so we need to better identify Parkinson's disease subtypes and then apply different pharmacological interventions based on that particular subtype. We also don't have good ways to measure clinical progression, and I think there are several initiatives to identify biomarkers that will uh, not only help us diagnose Parkinson's disease, but also help subtype it and perhaps help us identify progression. Having said that, it hasn't stopped us from doing multiple trials, as you saw in the prior uh, prior slide, but ongoing trials, uh, the initiative of National Institute of Health, the NETPD group, we've been using creatine for many, many years, and um, I'm eagerly uh, awaiting uh, the results. Uh, obviously, creatine is available over the counter, but it was specially prepared for this particular trial. I will discuss this uh, FS zone, which is um, an anti-diabetic drug out of all uh, other drugs. And then I'm going to talk about a calcium channel blocker and these long names uh, we don't have to worry about, but I will go over the mechanism by which they might work to slow down the disease. And inosin, which elevates the urate levels, and I'll come back to these in, in a little bit of detail. These is radipine and inosin. Now, this, this drug, peoglitazone, there are many drugs of this class. Uh, the first one had some liver issues, but this one really seems to be reasonably safe. And it stimulates some receptors in the uh, cell that lead to anti-inflammatory and anti-apoptotic effects. And apoptosis, apoptosis, apoptosis is a programmed cell death, and it seems to prevent uh, this kind of cell death in, in some animal models. And this is being looked at for uh, in, in a futility study to see if it will uh, give us a hint whether to proceed for a long-term simple study over many years to see if it affects Parkinson's disease progression. Another interesting approach came out of Chicago research. Uh, this was published in Nature back uh, 2007. The brain... Uh, the areas of the brain that are susceptible to neurodegeneration can be so close together, like the substantia nigra zona compacta that is susceptible and something that's less susceptible, that's the ventral tegmental area. They're so close to each other. But what is the difference between these two cell groups? It's, it's more or less a mystery, but it looks like the nigra neurons, as an individual grows, you switch from sodium channel to calcium channel. And maybe there is something about that calcium channel dependence that leads to the introduction of some toxic molecules into these cells. Or that mechanism itself is deleterious to the health of a cell. And ventral tegmental area, which is right next to it, is not degenerated in Parkinson's disease. It doesn't seem to switch, which suggests that maybe this switch has a role to play. So if you block the calcium channels, you go back to your sodium dependence, and that may be protective. And that was shown in an MPTP mouse model where is ridopine actually protected the mice against cell death induced by MPTP. Now, I've already alluded to the fact that MPTP model is not a faithful model of Parkinson's disease, but certainly we are hoping that at least in some cases it will 
guide us to develop agents for neuroprotection. MPTP model seems to be a good model to predict what drug causes dyskinesia and motor fluctuations and so on, but it's not a good model to assess neuroprotection. Now, next slide shows you a, a cartoon of somebody afflicted with gout. Gout is very painful, especially the acute attacks can lead to gouty tophi and so on and so forth. So having high urate is not always good, with one exception, and that is that if you have high urate, you're less likely to get Parkinson's disease. What is it telling me? I don't know. Urate has some antioxidative properties, but it may have other actions that we don't understand. And so what, what they've done is they're giving an agent called inosin to increase the urate and, and see if that will slow down the progression of Parkinson's. The first step is CSF, cerebrospinal fluid analysis, to see if we can actually effectively increase urate level in the central nervous system where probably it will have some benefit, if anything. Uh, I was only going to talk about medical therapy, but I know that the question of gene therapy is going to come up, and I'm not an expert, but I can tell you that right now there is one gene trial that is ongoing. It's, it's employing a, a ligand, nurturin, uh, which is made by Sergene uh, Pharma. It's uh, attached to a, a viral vector that itself is harmless, and it goes into the brain, and then it s stimulates the GDNF, the glial drive nerve growth factor receptor. And that will then result in, in, in more better cell survival and perhaps better connectivity and therefore improve symptoms in, in Parkinson's disease. But remember, the earlier trial using nurturing only in the putamen failed, but now what they're doing is they are giving enough into the nigra as well as putamen. It seems like if you give it in the putamen, the, the nigra striatal tract and Parkinson's disease doesn't transport things as well as they had hoped to. So if you put it directly in the nigra, perhaps you'll make a difference. But again, this is only affecting the motor problems, not any of the non-motor issues. So that's the limitation of gene therapy. What I was excited about was this next drug. It was Cogaine. Uh, there's a number attached to it, and uh, you see there are three slides, uh, pictures on the right. If you give somebody a normal mouse um, just, just saline. These are the number of cells on the top. If you give them MPTP, which will destroy many of these cells, and then just treat them with another shot of saline, the cells die. But if you pre-treat the animals with this oral compound, you protect the cells, which is quite an interesting finding. But as I said, it's been shown with many, many agents in, in uh, MPTP model. And this drug, the PIM50028, goes through the blood-brain barrier, and it enhances nerve growth factors in all neurons. So as I said, there's motor problems, there are non-motor problems. So if you affect just the nigrostriatal tract, you will affect the motor problems, but the non-motor issues will progress. But if you can give something through the mouth, where the bloodstream, hopefully things that get through the blood-brain barrier, can go anywhere in the central nervous system and even the peripheral nervous system. And if you can enhance cell survival in all these different places where Parkinson's disease pathology exists, we will have something that actually slows down the clinical progression of Parkinson's disease. I was excited about this drug because it also seemed to work in MPTP primate model, which uh, is, is a tough model, um, again, to predict the, uh, the effects in human. But unfortunately, uh, the phase two trial failed to meet the primary endpoint, which was how quickly the Parkinson disease progresses. But this doesn't mean this is the end of the story because I think this is where the future is. You've got to have something we give systemically that protects cells all over the place. All trials we've done, with the exception of Datatop, utilize one agent. And I think in the future, I'll come back to that in a second, we will have multiple we'll probably try multiple agents at the same time. Now, if you look at the mechanism, the, 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 there are few possible mechanisms that lead to cell death. The, the com end result is common, oxidative stress, apoptosis, cell death, inflammation, so on and so forth. But what starts it, and there are hypotheses like it's due to 
hyperphosphorylation of alpha synuclein. This will be analogous to what happens in Alzheimer's disease. And then if the prion hypothesis is correct, if you can inhibit alpha synuclein, which is abnormal or aggregated, passing from one cell to the other, then you can slow down the progression. And lastly, pharmacogenomics. Can we do some genetic studies? There is most common dominant sporadic a dominant mutation in, in apparently sporadic Parkinson's disease is LARC2 mutation. And maybe there are some agents that will work better in LARC2-related PD than other populations. But right now we don't identify these individuals prior to the trial. And I'll come back to that uh, LARC2 a little later in the talk. But I'm very fond of uh, cocktails, uh, obviously those of... Uh, you who know what I'm talking about, they, they make life pleasant in moderation. But here I'm talking about uh, another kind of cocktail. That's cocktail of drugs, medications. If you look at HIV, if you look at cancer, if you look at tuberculosis, the biggest advances have been made using multiple drugs at the same time. We do that for the symptomatic treatment, but we have not adopted that for neuroprotection or slowing the disease progression. I think this is where the future is, and I look forward to future trials where we combine multiple drugs, maybe one anti-inflammatory drug with the MAOB inhibitor with creatine to see if we can get additive benefits. I think we've done enough with just one single drug, and it's time to reconsider. Now moving on to... Uh, lower-hanging fruit, which is uh, managing Parkinson's disease motor disability. I think we've done well with medications, and if medications fail, we have uh, had wonderful results with uh, surgical interventions, including deep brain stimulation. Let's go back uh, a few years. This is a monkey on picture number one, normal, alert, looking at you, given reserpine. Reserpine came from India. Uh, Reserpine is an original, uh, it is a derivative of a Rovolfia alkaloid, and Leonard Rovolfia, the German botanist, went to India and brought this uh, plant that was used in India to treat psychosis because these uh, uh, patients with psychosis agitated. You give them Reserpine or Rovolfia, and they became like this monkey on number two. They became Parkinsonian and quieter and unable to move, hunched back on, page, on number three, uh, panel here on the slide, but thanks to Urban Carlson and others later, given levodopa, this monkey on picture four looks entirely normal. This discovery of levodopa has probably been the most amazing discovery in neuroscience, and initially we almost gave up on levodopa because there was no carbidopa, so people got nauseated and we did not limit, we did not limit the nausea and the patients would not go up to high enough levels, but subsequently we have realized that levodopa remains the most potent medication for symptomatic control of Parkinson's disease, especially for the motor features. So can we do better than if you have a drug that's really so good, and, and most of you who took this compound were very happy for many years, but subsequently because of the pharmacokinetic, perhaps pharmacodynamic changes, uh, pharmacokinetic characteristics of the drug itself uh, lead to problems, which we might talk about in a minute. But what can we do then? Can we improve delivery of what we have in our hands? And that is an effort that's ongoing with many different drugs. So let's talk about levodopa therapy. What is in the future? And Yogi Berra said it's hard to make a prediction, especially about the future, and I agree with him, but I'm going to just go over some of the things that are actually very close to approval. One drug is called Riteri. It's an Impex compound. Uh, we were hoping it, it, it would be improved, uh, approved last year, but it hasn't. It should be any time. It's a drug that's uh, delivered. It's got a special delivery system, so you have a more prolonged delivery to the small bowel. There's a very small portion of small bowel where we get the uh, absorption, and this drug improves the uh, absorption and prolongs uh, the duration of levodopa. Another drug is a almost levodopa prodrug. It's absorbed throughout the intestine. It's called XP21279. Sorry about the number, but it doesn't have a name yet. It's shown promise in early trials. There was a patch development. Unfortunately, 
the skin irritation uh, stopped uh, the patch from development. Uh, I think in the future, and it's not in the next two, three years, but in the future maybe we'll have programmable patches or pumps that uh, a lot of people are working on, super concentrated solutions that are in a very precise way are delivered even to demand. And then intragenual infusion is here. It's called Duodopa, and I'll come back and talk about that in a second. Now, Carbidopa, as you know, is a drug that prevents the conversion of dopa to dopamine in the periphery. But how much do we need and how should we deliver it has always been unclear. It looks like if you give it Carbidopa patch, which gives you constant Carbidopa, there's no harm having more Carbidopa, absolutely not, uh, then it may be that you can improve delivery of levodopa into the brain and help symptoms for uh, for longer. Even amantadine, Symmetrol, which we use for dyskinesia, the long-acting formulation is now being developed by a pharmaceutical company. There are discussions about developing antecopone patch. Some of you who took Compt inhibitor tolcopone probably miss it still because Tasmar was the most potent drug other than levodopa to enhance the levodopa's benefits, but because of a very small risk of liver problem, somehow the drug has largely been abandoned. I, I'm still a big fan of tolcopone, and I hope that there will be other COMPT inhibitors that are as potent as tolcopone, and they are, being de they are being developed, but they're not close to approval. We have several long-acting dopamine agonists. We already have ropinirol, pamipex are long-acting. The reticotine batch is back, and there's lisuride batch, which is an ergot drug without the heart problems associated with the older ergot drugs. We also are trying to develop continuous delivery of lisuride, the same drug we were talking about a minute, uh, a, a minute ago, and apomorphine pump, which uh, can be given uh, subcutaneously. So let's look at these two things that some, both are approved uh, in Europe, in some countries in Europe for sure. Duodopa, there is a pump, there's a specially formulated levodopa gel that goes, the, the tube, there's a peg tube, goes through the stomach, into the jejunum, and it's called duodopa, but it's actually dropped into the jejunum. It probably should be called jejojopa, which will be really a bad word, but that's what it is exactly. And so you drip it all day and 18 hours a day, and then you can stop it during the night. A lot of patients in Europe are not stopping at night, and it seems to almost remove motor fluctuations, and over long term may improve this kinesia. It will be a serious competitor to, uh, to deep brain stimulation, but there are issues involved with local injury, irritation, and the cost is going to be a factor. Then subcutaneous apomorphine. Apomorphine, some of you take it, apokin for PRN, rescue therapy, if you can infuse it. It's as potent as levodopa, the only agonist that's as potent. The problem is it causes skin irritation and nodules, and in England especially, they have worked their way around it. And it also seems to be a serious competitor to deep brain stimulation. If you don't want a hole in your head, then this may be something to consider. Unfortunately, it's many years away in this country, and, and right now the companies are talking about starting trials. Moving on to MAOB inhibitors, some of you are taking uh, either selegiline or rosagiline. The next MAOB inhibitor that has been in development for a long time but I think should be approved is safinamide. I don't know the trade name. This, in addition to inhibiting MAOB, also blocks glutamate release, which can result in anti-seizure activities, and it may also improve cognition. It's an interesting drug, and you should uh, keep an eye on it. Uh, the other group of compounds that are being developed are adenosine receptor antagonists. Caffeine is one of them. And we know caffeine by itself can have some symptomatic benefit on Parkinson's disease. And if you like caffeine, there is no downside to drinking caffeine. Music for it's Starbucks years, but that's not what I'm promoting. So here we go. Uh, A2A antagonist, we were excited about it. Tadaflin, it's going to come back. And the other agents that are in development include preladenant, which is, I believe, developed by Merck, and there's a small company developing trazadenant. Unfortunately, I put the number SIN115. I didn't know the full name. I have it now, but trazadenant. But they are all the same. They work on the 
indirect pathways, and I'm not. I'm going to actually skip a slide because of time. They work on the indirect pathway to restore balance between direct and indirect pathways, and seem to help dyskinesia and off times. Next slide actually looks at other mechanisms by which we can we can affect Parkinson's disease. One is treating dyskinesia. Well, we tried to target the serotonin receptors and failed. There's another one which is quite interesting, which has promise, alpha adrenergic antagonist, uh, which is, works on the noradrenergic type of receptors, and that's fipemazole. Interestingly, there's a strong epidemiologic data that nicotine or smoking has some protective effect in terms of getting PD or not, but clinical trials on patients who already have PD have largely been negative, but still new, more specific nicotine receptor agonists are being being developed as well. Uh, I know I have probably got maybe 10 more minutes at the most. Uh, I'm going to skip the adenosine receptor slide, but move on to the next uh, s uh, drug in this class, which is preladenant. And it's been looked at uh, in, in phase one and two, and is right now in phase three studies, which is the uh, phase just before approval has some side effects, mostly manageable. doesn't look like uh, that uh, liver problems will be uh, an issue except in high doses. So we've got to keep an eye on that, but uh, it, it seems to be quite safe. Now, how about dyskinesia? I talked about the, uh, the 5 ht receptors uh, drugs that fail, but how about can we target other other uh, neurotransmitters. And one of the ones that's been always talked about is glutamate. Glutamate is very important for learning, but it's also very toxic in high concentration. It's excitatory, which is not very, very good. Um, in Parkinson's disease, the cort cortex projects to the striatum through uh, and release. There is a glutamate release. If you block this glutamate release uh, by using the m r 5 antagonist, uh, there is a drug developed by Novartis. There are other companies looking at agents that act on that receptor, which is a, uh, I won't go into the details of what receptors, but the problem is sometimes you see psychosis with this class of drugs, and a lot of our Parkinson's patients, unfortunately, are beginning to have cognitive issues when they develop dyskinesia. So I'm looking forward to the to the results, but there are still concerns uh, with this this type of these type of drugs. One of those m r 5 antagonists, this is diprogluran. I, I don't know what stage of development it is. Uh, it, oh, I think phase two study showed that it, it helped L-dopa induced dyskinesia. It was named as one of the top 10 neuroscience projects to watch, but I don't know who named that, but phase three studies are planned. So keep an eye open for the m r 5 antagonist. Fipamazole, this is a drug that works on the adrenergic receptor. They did two country study. In the U.S., it showed clear evidence of uh, uh, improvement in liver dopa dyskinesia, but in the Indian study subset, the placebo was as good. I have an idea. I, I was actually involved in trying to select sites. Looks like uh, the investigators did not do a great job defining dyskinesia or, or you know, really looking at the differences. There are, subtle, there are subtleties here that uh, that really teach us that when we do these investigations, they have to be conducted in the hands of experts and, and not just any site. All right, moving on. Uh, last few minutes, so treating the non-motor issues. Uh, Parkinson's disease psychosis is a major problem. Hallucinations occur in a large number of patients. We use clozapine and cotiapin, which is Seroquel, but these drugs have limitations. There's a new drug being developed by Acadia. It's called Pimvanserine. It's a 5-HT2A antagonist and inverse agonist. And one wants to know, well, what's the difference between an antagonist and an inverse agonist? And it has to do with the baseline. Uh, you see that uh, antagonist doesn't change the baseline, whereas inverse agonist will make the cell less excitable, even at baseline. And this drug um, uh, is is being studied in uh, in phase three uh, for Parkinson's disease psychosis. It doesn't have the same side effects as, say, cotiapin and high dose might have, which is Parkinsonism worsening, 
a closer bean, which is agranulocytosis, but still we don't have final proof that this drug works, but I'm keeping an eye open for that. Moving on to constipation, which is a major problem in Parkinson's disease and in normal aging. And I'm almost 60, and I know I, I know what, what the old people talk about. And Parkinson's disease constipation, this can be controlled with usual means, but sometimes you have to uh, do uh, aggressive uh, therapy. Uh, there's a drug that's used in, in constipation. It's called lubiprostone. I can't pronounce it very easily. It has been studied. A small double-blind study done by Dr. Ando in Houston was positive, and I would hope there will be more studies. Uh, there is a subtype of constipation, Parkinson's, called puborectalis dysfunction. There's a sling here that gives that angle to the rectum and the anal junction, and in the squatting posture that we Indians used in India, this uh, this straightens out, and, and it's, it's a little, little, little bit of a joke, but if you haven't used an Indian toilet, that's not going to be an option for you, but it seems like squatting posture facilitates emptying your bowels more than... I would say don't try it at home because it can be risky trying to sit on the English toilet. All right, moving on to treating uh, orthostatic hypotension, which is a major problem in some conditions like Scheidt-Rager syndrome, but also happens in Parkinson's. There's a drug kind of which we were hoping would get a uh, approvable letter, but it did not. It's called droxydopa, which makes norepinephrine, which raises your blood pressure. And that's what you need when you stand up. You want your norepinephrine level to go up. And it's, droxydopa is converted by carbidopa to this, I mean, sorry, dopa decarboxylase to norepinephrine. It looks like carbidopa doesn't impair that conversion. So this drug actually has promise in treating hypertension in many different etiologies, not just in Parkinson's disease. And you should keep an eye open for that as well. Now, the last word about, no, it's not the last word, but last two slides on pharmacogenetics. There's a long history of that in other fields. In uh, malaria, if you give anti-malarial drugs, if you carry the G6PD deficiency gene, you get huge hemolysis. So it's useful to know who has it and who doesn't. In anesthesia, if you lack an enzyme, you can get severe reaction with the anesthetic drugs. And people are routinely screened if you're going to use that particular drug. But in Parkinson's disease, we are still in the infancy. Now, this is the founder of Google, Sergey Brin, who's also uh, involved in the website 23andMe. So, so many of you are familiar. He is a lark to career. That is a dominant mutation that predisposes you to get Parkinson's disease. And one agent that we've already tried and failed in general population was a kinase inhibitor called CEP1347. Well, will it work on Sergey Brain? I don't know, but that's the future. We've got to target therapies to individual patients. There was one study on COMPT inhibitors. If you carry the HH allele, your, the on time you get with COMPT inhibitor is much more impressive than if you get the LL gene. So I see patients, I give them COMPT and they do so well. The others say, I don't know what you gave me. Nothing happened, doctor. It's variability. This variability is seen with all drugs. We just don't know why, and we're trying to get a handle studying the genetic makeup of an individual. And I think this will be very important because now we have really we have great knowledge of genomics, and we will be able to probably figure out the subtypes of Parkinson's disease where one drug might work better than others. Wouldn't it be nice to have a marker for liver toxicity with tolcapone? The other 99% can take it safely, but we don't have a marker yet, and I think that is the future in Parkinson's disease. So, hope I have convinced you that Yogi Bear was wrong. He said future ain't what it used to be, but I think future is exciting. There seemed to be a little pause in new drug approval for Parkinson's disease, and this due to several factors. It's very difficult to get a drug approved for central nervous system disorder. It takes a longer time, and it takes a lot more money. And I think in the end, patients will pay off, and we'll have drugs not only to slow down Parkinson's disease progression, but to also treat motor and non-motor symptoms effectively. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sethi. That was just terrific. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think you've just received a full graduate course in Parkinson's. Uh, it took 30 minutes. You pick up your diplomas on the way out, uh, even complete with a reference um, to uh, the American national sport from a gentleman who was 
born in the Indian subcontinent, I think, uh, uh, compliment you on that too, Dr. Sethi. Uh, speaking uh, just for myself and uh, listening to you uh, uh, so intently, I was very struck, as I'm sure many of our people were on the phone, at how many, they may be rather small, rather low, um, they're dealing with just a piece of the disorder, uh, but they cover so many more different aspects of Parkinson's than was true, let's say, a decade ago, when almost all of the drugs that we had were focused just upon the motor system. And now we have uh, something dealing with dyskinesia, uh, reformulations of uh, levodopa, carbidopa, uh, cognitive stuff. Um, it's just so many different kinds of things. And that certainly should give us um, some uh, extra hope, even though none of them are yet, uh, uh, to use your phrase, uh, chasing the holy grail. They certainly are giving us more to work with. Uh, Dr. Sethi, I have a question. This is a little, really a little unfair, uh, and I hope it's not uh, too unfair. You, you talked about so many treatments that are in the pipeline. That was your, your topic. And it was, you didn't always give an indication as to what is uh, most likely to be around the corner. And I wonder if from the large selection that you took us through, uh, what is likely to get the FDA okay in the next, let's, let's say, a year or two, as okay. opposed to a dream 10 years away. Could you give us a little bit of a timeline sense? Sure. I think it's, it's not an unfair question uh, because that's what we, 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 we want to know. Um, uh, I want to be around when the next drug is approved. So surely, I think the first drug that will be approved, and I would, may be wrong, it would be the impact drug, right, Terry, which is an incremental improvement over existing levodopa. It's not dramatic. You get another hour, hour and a half. A direct competitor, uh, triple combination Stilevo. It seemed to be even better than Stilevo in those trials. So that would be approved first. And the next one probably will be Duodopa, which is the uh, intrajugenal pump, which is only going to be for a small subset of patients. I think safenamide, which, uh, as I said, I don't know who's developing it. It, It's changed hands so many times. Actually, they have all the data. It just needs to be submitted. That will be probably the third one. Uh, Droxidopa, FDA um, asked them to do a trial using certain endpoints for hypertension, and they introduced a new questionnaire that had never been used. And then when the results came in, they changed their tone and said, well, listen, we don't think this is a good endpoint. So although droxidopa, the, the, the trial results show the drug works, I think they may have to do one more trial, and I think that would be somewhere between duodopa and, uh, and safenamide. So these are the four that I think have the highest chance of being approved in the next uh, next two years, maybe sooner, one year, between Wonderful. one and two years. Terrific. Thank you very much. Very direct to answer the question. Much appreciated. Um, we've had several questions from around the country and a couple from outside on specific medications, which I believe were not covered by you. And I'm going to just do, if I may, Dr. Sethi, just a quick one, two, three, four, give you the name of it. You can maybe give us a couple of sentences on it. And um, if um, if you really covered it or if it was under a different name, which is possible, um, then please um, uh, abrade me and I'll move on to the next one. Uh, so uh, f- uh, just a, there are four or five of these. Um, okay. Uh, you talked about gene therapy um, from Florida. A lady wanted to know uh, what promise do you think for Parkinson's uh, is there in stem cell therapy? Oh, that's 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 a tough one. Um, I think stem cells hold promise in in, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But we have a lot to do before we can even design and start double-blind clinical trials. I know stem cells are being used around the world in different countries without any control. Uh, the challenge will be how to control stem cells once you have. Uh, uh, transplanted them, where to put them, what dose, um, only one area is enough or we have to put them in 10 brain areas because it's such a widespread disease and I, I'm certainly not an authority on this, um, but certainly I think we should continue researching stem cells in Parkinson's disease. Thank you. Question from New York, a caregiver in New York, um, something that I hadn't heard of and I don't think you covered, uh, studies of GM1 gangliosides? Yes. GM1 gangliosides has been around for a long time, and there was a recent study after I prepared the slide deck and knew they were older, older studies. And gangliosides are, you know, integral to a, a neuronal structure, and uh, there are uh, 
a lot of the work came from uh, Snyder in Philadelphia, and I think uh, gangliosides were being developed by a company in Italy as well for a while, and subsequently I don't know where it went. I think that gangliosides need further study, but there is no, no agent uh, that's very close to approval or in phase three studies that I know of. But I did hear something about GM1 gangliosides uh, therapy trial just recently, and I'm embarrassed to say I don't know the results. But I'll, I'll look up, and I can, I'll can. be happy to contact this person. Thank you. The next, uh, you talked about one kind of gene therapy, neutron, um, and you spoke highly of the possibilities of that in the nearer term. Um, a doctor from Texas, I think a medical doctor, I'm not sure about that, was asking you about ProSavin. Yes, I think that may be a, a, a trade name for aromatic amino acid uh, decarboxylase gene, if I'm right. There was a, another one, for GAD, for GAD gene into the subthalamic. That, that effort has been abandoned, but the other one that the, the doctor mentioned is still ongoing. It enhances the uh, de decarboxylation of levodopa uh, and to dopamine and perhaps better motor benefit. Uh, it's it's uh, kind of it, it almost like a pharmacological, genetic pharmacolo pharmacological treatment, whereas uh, the nurturing, and I have no stake in either of those two companies uh, for disclosure. I think that's, that's just a different uh, mechanism where you're trying to enhance cell uh, function as well as cell survival. So it appeared to be more attractive to me, but are the other one's still ongoing as well, absolutely. And I, as I said, I wasn't really going to cover gene therapy, but since I liked the idea, I was a bit biased. Mm. Thank you. Uh, the question of intravenous glutathione? Uh, yes. Uh, now, we know that glutathione is decreased in the brains of Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, at autopsy, it's been well shown. We know that glutathione is an antioxidant, and oxidative stress is involved in, um, in the genesis of Parkinson's disease. But whether giving intravenous glutathione changes Parkinson's disease in any way, is entirely unclear. There's no proof that uh, glutathione therapy actually improves Parkinson's disease progression or slows down the progression. Uh, I know that several of you uh, are believers, and I, you know, don't want to uh, dash any hopes. I mean, if, if there are costs involved, there are side effects involved, uh, and there are a lot of physicians that are willing to offer treatments that are not yet fully studied and are claiming success, but I'm not a believer, and I would not encourage anybody to go get it. Thank you. Your candor is, 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 is appreciated on all fronts, and thank you for being so direct with us. Uh, the matter, this is, here's one that's new to me, methylene blue. Apparently there was a study, a Canadian correspondent of ours is saying there was a study in 2009 that he had um, read somewhere, and he hasn't heard anything since. Methylene blue? That gives a new meaning to <laughs> I feel blue. Uh, I don't know the blue man group. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't, I just don't know. I, well, maybe I'll maybe the up. maybe I'll the person up. maybe the person who asked that question could uh, fill us in a little bit. That 2009 study online after the meeting, Wonderful. and we'll try and get back That'd to you. Uh, this isn't strictly a um, uh, question about a possible new treatment, but it's asked in the opposite direction. It's a, a person with Parkinson's from South Carolina, and uh, she wants to know, doctor, could calcium supplements that might be taken by a woman for um, uh, for osteoporosis uh, have a negative effect um, uh, on Parkinson's or the medicines that are used for it. Right. I think that's a good question, uh, but no, absolutely not. In fact, if somebody has a propensity for falling, the first thing we do is strengthen their bones. You want to get their bone scan, make sure they have enough bony mass so they're not susceptible to fractures. So you do everything possible to slow down or improve osteoporosis, so please don't be concerned. It's a totally different deal. Uh, you can take calcium supplementation or whatever other drugs your physician advises you. Good. Okay, that uh, completes our list of uh, random questions about specific things, and it was, we didn't even prepare you for those, and you answered them brilliantly, so thank you very, very much. Um, on another um, subject, we have a caller from Israel. Um, who was noting that um, deep brain stimulation is used extensively in the country of Israel to um, uh, enable people to live less with uh, some of the dopamine agonists 
and some of the other uh, medicines for Parkinson's that may have side effects, so they use surgery somewhat earlier than they do in the, the she thinks in the United States. Could you uh, comment on that? Do you, rec- do you recommend in general um, in your clinical role that um, someone who is doing well with medicines for Parkinson's should consider deep brain stimulation either early or late? Right. Um, this question has uh, been around for a long time. Um, initially, when deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus uh, was started, there was hope that it actually slowing down the Parkinson's disease. And if that was so, uh, it will make sense to consider deep brain stimulation, even if you were doing medically well. But unfortunately, it's become very clear that patients who are, have undergone deep brain stimulation continue to progress and develop new motor and non-motor problems. Now, when you start having fluctuations in dyskinesia, there is a move towards doing deep brain stimulation earlier in the course than we used to do. But that doesn't mean you offer it to patients who are otherwise doing well. There are two trials right now ongoing, and there are two countries. There's one from Nashville, one in uh, France, uh, uh, where they're doing uh, deep brain stimulation young patients very close to the diagnosis, which to me is early, early. And, you know, it, it's worth researching into, but you, there are risks associated with deep brain stimulation. It's not entirely an aqueous procedure. So if you're tolerating medications, if you're not having fluctuation dyskinesia, I don't think deep brain stimulation should be considered. If you're intolerant of medications, I have done deep brain stimulations in some patients quite early. But if you're not fluctuating and you're not having major side effects of medications, I think you should wait. Thank you, Dr. Sethi. I'm going to take one more question before we have a tie-up session. I know that Dr. Sethi has to go back to his, uh, he's on clinical service today, and so even, we're even more grateful to him that he's taken time out of a very, very busy day to uh, talk with us, but he does have to leave rather sharply on the hour. Um, this is more of a general uh, philosophical question, but an, uh, but an enduring one, and one that I think all our correspondents will be interested in, Dr. Sethi. It has to do with the way drugs are regulated in various parts of the world. And this person who lives with Parkinson's in the state of California um, is asking the question, um, uh, what solutions, what lessons can we learn from uh, from systems, let's just say Western Europe, where they have their own drug um, uh, review and regulatory agency uh, that could uh, hasten the adoption of a legitimate uh, efficacious treatments in the United States. Um, I don't know whether he or she had this in mind, but you talked about Duodopa um, uh, during your talk, Dr. Sethi, and that was a um, medication uh, administered through the, um, through, the, uh, uh, through the stomach that is, was used in Europe and approved in Europe as many as, what, 10 years ago, 9 years ago, many, many years ago. So there's a lot of frustration that people feel when they see something like that happening and they can't get it here in the United States where the regulatory agencies may be using uh, different uh, standards and uh, not as responsive perhaps as they might be uh, to the decisions made in Japan or in, uh, or in Europe or, or any other area of the world where there's um, uh, reputable agencies doing regulatory work. So uh, do you have any advice, thoughts about this? Is it a problem? Is it uh, a rather rare instance? Um, is the question of harmonization, that's a word that's often used to describe uh, regulatory agencies getting together and, and agreeing on something, is that something, Dr. Sethi, you think that would hasten the adoption of new treatments uh, in this country? What views do you have generally on the whole subject of, uh, of, 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 of uh, getting the regulatory process streamlined and uh, effects and results more quickly delivered to patients? So the length of that question suggests how complicated it is. I mean, you, you, you said, said it very eloquently. I mean, this is one of the most difficult questions for me to answer uh, in the last minute. We, we probably need to, again, I think I'm just advising, have an hour of this, this particular, get, get a regulatory, get a doctor, and do this. will be a wonderful uh, point, counterpoint uh, for your next uh, uh, webcast. That's uh, a great so, idea. Yes, having said that, uh, I mean, it's frustrating. It's very frustrating to a physician where I get a medicine from Canada for nausea, Domperidone, which has been around the rest of the world for 20 years. And I have several patients, at least one or two every year, that are fairly liver because of nausea, and I get them Domperidone. 
and explain to them why, and they do wonderfully well. And it's it's so sad that the, one of the most developed countries in the world, we don't have access to drugs that are relatively <clears throat> safe. Uh, Duodopa, they wanted us to do a double-blind trial, which was not required by the EMEA in Europe, and that always delays things. Uh, that, when drugs work, some drugs work, they work. Levodopa was approved as, a, as an amino acid. It was not even... Uh, it's, it's really a naturally occurring amino acid, and I don't think it went through double-blind trials, and it works. When it works, it works. Uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, we, we need to use common sense, and you're right, harmonization <laughs> might be the way to go in these uh, uh, therapies that, that are quite expensive, very hard to develop, and for which we have evidence over 30, 40 years that the drug actually works. All we are doing is improving the delivery of the drug. It shouldn't hold that to the same standard as an entirely new compound. So, but who does that? I mean, that's the question. This is a much bigger uh, problem than we can address here. But it's a wonderful uh, topic for you to discuss. That's wonderful. Um, again, mindful of your time, you may have to hop off while I'm doing my public service announcements. And right. uh, just in case you do have to hop off, uh, may I just say first how very, very grateful we are. There are 442 people who have uh, been listening to you uh, avidly for the last hour. Um, several hundred more have signed up and uh, will be taking this through the archived material, which is where about half of our people um, who sign up for things uh, take advantage of these sessions. And all of us, if you could hear the applause, we don't have the facility for this, so you won't hear it, but everybody's clapping quietly at your terrific presentation, certainly at the Parkinson Disease Foundation office. We're doing this um, uh, uh, right now as I'm speaking. So thank you so much, and um, um, uh, we'll, uh, I will proceed with my PSAs, if I may. Uh, first of all, to thank um, our sponsors uh, for the series, Expert Briefings, uh, AbV, formerly Abbott Pharmaceuticals, Teva Neuroscience, and UCB, three companies that support our series generously, but let me assure you they have nothing to do, nor do they seek to have anything to do with the editorial content of what we do, which is entirely the responsibility of the PDF and its expert advisors like Dr. Sethi. Uh, I want to remind you, those of you who uh, are, are regulars, you know this already, an archive of the event will be available to you starting next week, uh, Tuesday, April 23rd, um, at www.pdf.org. Uh, we will send you an email when it's available so that you can listen to it again or let your friends know about it and um, enjoy it again. Certainly, it was uh, he covered so much material. I, for one, certainly want to hear it at least once more. Uh, for those of you who are seeking continuing education credit, CEU credit, we will be sending you an email this very afternoon with a link uh, that you can use to take the required test, and uh, we hope you'll take advantage of that. Um, I'd like to announce uh, also the next uh, briefing in the series. Um, it's going to be on Tuesday, June 4th. We always do them on Tuesdays. We always do them at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, United States Time and everybody else takes their cues from there. Um, and this one is Tuesday, June 4th, and it will be delivered by Angela Roberts South, um, and she will be talking on the subject of improving communication in Parkinson's disease uh, under the rather charming title um, and meaningful title of One Voice, Many Listeners. So if you're interested in communication, this is one of the topics that came up when we crowdsourced you um, and we take it seriously. A uh, very, very important issue in Parkinson's, how, to, how people speak and how people listen to those who speak uh, when they have Parkinson's. And this will be on that subject um, on Tuesday, June the 4th. Please do take a minute, as most of you are very good at doing, um, to complete our online survey. We do take this very seriously. It should be on your screen as I'm speaking, and um, it doesn't take more than a couple of minutes to fill out, so please do it and send it back to us. Uh, the feedback really does help us improve the webinars and the selection of subjects to make sure that you get the information um, that you need. Um, some people asked questions that were not answered. A couple of them were not quite on the subject. Um, um, a couple of them were, and we didn't get to them. Uh, you may have, uh, others may have occurred to you during this Q&A session. If they have, please take advantage of the, um, of the uh, connection routine that you had described to you. Um, and, uh, and, and email us uh, and let us know what the question is, and we will endeavor to get back to you in a few days, either through Dr. Sethi or through some other authoritative source so that you get your question answered. 
um, uh, then it all just remains for me to thank you very much for joining us and making this such a special occasion. Hope you had a good time listening to it, as I certainly did. Um, we will look forward to hearing you and uh, knowing that you're there again on June 4th. And in the meantime, have a, for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, have a very lovely spring season. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to connecting up with you at a future occasion in the near, in the near future. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Enjoy. Bye-bye.